Hello, hello, and welcome to another podcast episode of Overpowering Emotions, where I talk all things big emotions, anxiety, emotion regulation. I'm in my comorbidity series right now, and today I'm going to be talking about ADHD and anxiety specifically. I'm first going to talk a little bit about ADHD just to make sure we're on the same page, along with the co-occurrence of anxiety. Um, And that's really important because anxiety is the most common comorbidity. They're like best friends that like to hang out. Half of the ADHD population, probably more, but for sure half, also experience anxiety. So we see this very clear link between the two. And there's implications for when we go to treat them, especially when there's medications involved. Uh, In addition to the co-occurrence with ADHD and anxiety, I'm also going to talk about differentiating between the two. What's ADHD and what's anxiety? Because they can often look alike. They sort of mimic each other. And so the symptoms might look exactly the same, and then they get misdiagnosed. And that's a problem, right? If we're trying to treat anxiety and it's an executive functioning challenge. So quickly, what is ADHD? Well, it's neurodevelopmental behavioral disorder. So we, we, there's no blood test to say, yes, you have it or no, you don't. It's all based on our observations of what we see behaviorally from these kiddos and affects how the brain develops. And even more so it, it, it sort of slows down brain development. There's, we see this 30% delay in kiddos ADHD brain and, and not with smarts. It has absolutely nothing to do with how smart they are. It's all about the last part of our brain to develop their executive functioning parts of their brains, their thinking, their ability not to pay attention because they can totally pay attention to things that they're interested in, that they love doing, right? That they like. So they can pay attention, but it's, can you regulate your attention to do things that other people want you to do when there's something cooler over here that you would rather be doing, right? Can they sit still? Can they manage their impulses? Can they remember, okay, I just got to do my homework and then I can go and play my video game, right? Can I stay organized? Can I avoid distractions and focus on my work no matter what Billy is doing over there, right? Can I remember to do things, feed the dog at the end of the day, do my homework at the end of the day, even just remembering the instructions that I was just told? Can I remember more than one at a time? Um, you know, so, so it's the regulating their attention, regulating their emotions, regulating their behaviors. And for some kiddos, we do see this hyperactivity, their brain starting to shut down, they need to alert themselves. So they're fidgeting and up and running around. Not everybody though. Um, but really when we look at ADHD, I often talk about how it's misnamed because like I said, when kids are interested in something, they can pay attention. No problem which makes a lot of parents think, well, it's not ADHD. This kid has no attention problems. They hyper-focus on things that they love. Well, yeah, that's what the ADHD brain does. When it's something I'm into, it's, it's working just like everybody else's brain. So when we're looking at ADHD, it's really a difference rather than a disorder. It's a difference is in that executive functioning part of the brain. So it's more the deficits in self-regulation, right? More um, so self-regulating their attention. um, And so that's controlling their attention. I kind of use the analogy of a pinball machine, you know, when you're trying to, you're hitting the buttons, that's us trying to pay attention, right? And the little flappers are keeping the ball. And so that's us paying attention to whatever it is that we need to do. But in the ADHD brain, it don't matter how hard they're trying to pay attention. There are these random holes in the game where the ball's just gonna drop on its own. That's kind of what happens even when we're trying to pay attention. Um, My husband will say, look at me. And the more I try to look at him and pay attention, I'll even open my eyes wide. He just knows as soon as my eyes go wide. So I'm trying He's like, whatever, never mind. I'll just text it to you, right? It's like our brain sort of sabotages ourselves. So yes, kiddos can totally spend hours attending to a video game, anything that's stimulating that they love, but they have trouble to other things that other people want them to do, right? Usually because it's boring or it's repetitive or it's effortful or it's something that I've done before or it's something that I'd rather not do when I've got this iPad right in front of me, right? So it's it's about what they want to do versus what they have to do. 
So when we look at ADHD, it's not a skill deficit, really. It's a performance deficit. They know all the things they're not supposed to do or the, all the things they are supposed to do. They know they're not supposed to punch their sister in the face when she annoys them, right? They know that they're supposed to unpack their backpack and put their laundry away or whatever it is at the end of the day. They know what they're supposed to do, but what they can't do is doing what they need to do in the moment. It's really hard for them. And that's why we call it a performance deficit because they know they just can't do it when they need to do it. So when we're on the same page, when I look at executive functionings, those are our higher sort of level brain functions that we, we need to get started on tasks, to sustain our attention, our effort to task, completing tasks, problem solving. So they, they help us you know, regulate our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors. They help us figure out what task we're going to do first, prioritizing things, right? It's really important for insight, for making good decisions, good judgment, planning, organization. Um, there's a few different, you know, um, exec executive functions that we look at. Getting started on tasks, right? Right away when we're told to quickly and easily, we're not procrastinating. Uh, initiation also means stopping the fun to go and do work. So some of those transitions where some kiddos really have a hard time with. Obviously, focus is a part of it. Can I focus on this task long enough until it's done? Um, am I able to avoid distractions, whether it's external distractions that are happening in my environment or internal, you know, replaying something that's happened in my day or thinking about a game that I want to do or show that I want or thinking about what's going to happen later on today, right? So are we able to avoid some of those distractions? How are we to manage time? That's another one, time management. Um, again, that have to do versus want to do. Do we understand what the passage of time is? So when, when, our, when our parents say, okay, you know, we're, we're, you've got 10 more minutes, turn off your video game. Do they actually know what 10 minutes feels like? I would say if you say 10 minutes and they're playing a video game, their preferred thing, that 10 minutes is going to feel like two seconds, which is why they're like, you didn't give me 10 minutes. That was literally only one second. And you're like, literally, no, I gave you 20 minutes, right? Um, constantly being late. That's mine. I'm like, oh, I have five more minutes. I can totally do one more email, right? Or running out of time. Uh, working memory is a big, huge one. So being able to hold information in our head as we work on something. So holding in our head our idea when we're trying to listen to someone in a conversation, right? So we miss what people say in conversations. We miss instructions. Um, remembering where we put things. Oftentimes ADHDers lose things or they forget what they have to do. Um, I, I do some assessments and, you know, I'll one great example of working memory is skip counting. So when a kiddo has to skip count and, and just, I had a brilliant high school student not too long ago who was counting by tens, right? And so it was, um, let's, we'll just say starting from 78 counting by tens and it was 78, 88, 98, 102, right? So just lost focus, lost what they were trying to do. Um, so remembering information as I'm working through a task. If you say, hey, kiddo, go do one, two, and three, can they remember all those three things? Usually they can remember them long enough to say, oh yeah, okay, one, two, and three. But as soon as they turn to go do it, it's gone, right? Really the big picture that we're looking at is the self-regulation. So thinking about learning, making a plan, how do I get started on this task? What am I going to do if I run into a problem? Um, how is my friend going to react if I do this behavior, right? If I punch them in a the face or if I run up and give them a hug, how are they going to respond? And thinking ahead about all of those things. So we've got our self-regulation and also our regulation of our emotions, right? Managing our emotions to be able to control our behavior, managing our emotions to be able to complete a task, um, being able to persist, right? All of that affects learning, organization. Where did I put things? And organization also includes understanding the main point, seeing the big picture, knowing what's a priority, organizing my ideas, um, uh, behavioral disinhibition. In, in, in so that's like impulsivity, thinking about what I'm about to do ahead of it, of time, thinking about the consequences of our actions and being able to control our actions, control our attention, um, 
wait our turn, right? Whether it's with a game or if mom's on the phone, not interrupting her, right? Planning, preparing for school, creating a plan on how I'm going to solve this problem, doing it, evaluating it. How is it working? Um, doing things in the right order. Um, flexibility, right? Thinking about things in new ways, unlearning old ways of doing things so I can try a new way. Actually, my high school daughter, we keep butting heads right now because she's in finals and or when she was trying to study and I'm like, I've got some ideas about how to, nope, I've got this one way that I learned in grade two, right? And she's just so rigid. She can't think about how to learn a new way or just thinking about other people's perspectives, right? Um, trying new things even can be part of that flexibility. Being able to transition smoothly is part of flexibility. Adjusting to when things don't turn out, how we expected them to be, or if we have to make a change in the routine, coming up with new ways to solve problems. I mean, you can see that flexibility is a huge one here. Being able to tolerate those uncomfortable, strong feelings, knowing how to respond and adjust my behavior based on how other people are responding, right? Accepting their ideas and opinions, being able to change, you know, shift and adjust to, to suit sort of the group. So a lot of those kinds of things that we see with flexibility, which we also see with anxiety. Now, when we look at ADHD, like I said, it's considered a developmental delay um, and it's neuro. It's everything that's happening in the brain. All of those executive functioning processes, I gave lots of different examples there. They begin in the preschool years. And as they progress in school, we see their brain developing. So those executive functions are developing as well, right? Um, and so they're mastering sort of complex skills developmentally as they go. And so with these kiddos, you know, success is usually highly evaluated based on, um, well, in the number one place where they spend their time is at school, right? And so from kindergarten all the way to grade 12, success is all about the grades in school. Success in school, though, depends on their ability to plan, to organize, to manage their times, to prioritize tasks, to keep their materials and information organized, to know what's the main idea from the details that are supporting it, um, being flexibly, thinking flexibly, memorizing content, monitoring their progress, managing their emotions, managing their attention, right? So ADHD, oftentimes when I give the diagnosis, I say, congratulations, your kiddo meets criteria for ADHD or you have ADHD and here are all the reasons why ADHD is awesome. However, there's one problem with, with this ADHD thing and it's this thing called school, specifically grade one to 12, right? There are so many skills that they that they are need, need to do that they're required of them for just daily activities, daily routines, right? And if you think about homework, they have to write down all of their assignments correctly in the first place, right? And if they're having problem paying attention or processing information, it's like a broken radio. It's rarely written down. Definitely not all of the information that they need, maybe not in order. They might not even have heard it correctly. They only heard broken radio, bits and pieces of information. So they're trying to pull together what they think maybe the teacher said, right? So that's just writing the assignments down in the first place. Then they got to remember to bring all of the materials home that they need to do their homework in the first place, right? Chances are they're, they're not even thinking, oh, I just need my book. Oh, shoot, I forgot my calculator and I forgot this and that. They, so now I don't have my materials. Then they need to have the skills. I've just spent my whole day at school. My brain is exhausted, but I still need to muster up enough motivation to get started on the homework in the first place. And once I'm started, my brain's still tiring. I got to persist until that homework's done. And I got to do it in a timely manner. Right. And then I got to remember to put it all when I'm done. I can't just abandon it. I got to put it all, clean it all up, put my homework back in my backpack. And then I need to remember to turn it in tomorrow, a whole new day. Right. That's after again, a full day of tasks that they've already done. It's draining their executive functioning battery. So everything, just one thing that we're asking them to do, homework, is tapping out all of those skills that are already so hard for them.
right? No wonder anxiety is huge in the ADHD population, right? And especially when we think about our kids can might only be able to see 20 minutes into the future. So if you're telling your kiddo in the morning to remember to do the dishes, put their dishes away at the end of the day, the ADHD kiddo can't see that far into the future. They can't see themselves doing it. So at the end of the day, there's no chance that they're going to remember to do it, right? And if success is always about all the things that they need to do with their executive functions, they're not going to feel very successful, right? So why is it important to talk about ADHD and anxiety? Well, if you've got both ADHD and anxiety, which a lot of our kiddos do and a lot of our adults do, that anxiety is actually going to make the ADHD challenges worse, right? It's going to be even harder for them to pay attention and to listen. They're going to feel even more restless than usual. They're going to have even more trouble focusing and picking up instructions in the first place. The brain is already built to be anxious. If you've heard me talk before, our brain, everybody's brain, our human species brain is built to be anxious. But in the ADHD brain, it's even more problematic because we have this hyperactive, dysregulated amygdala. The amygdala and the emotional brain is that's actually a core deficit of ADHD is emotion dysregulation. And that's directly related to anxiety and actually sensory integration. So there's limited communication between that amygdala, that emotional brain and the rest of the brain, and especially the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, whose job is supposed to help calm down that emotional brain. And so the brain, it can't moderate all of the responses right? And, and, and that, that anxiety response, they're just so overcome with emotions, even more than typically developing kiddos. And so unfortunately that overreactive, overreactive amygdala, it's setting off alarms all the time. So kiddos are in this increased state of fight or flight all the time. They're spending way more time in the sympathetic nervous system, the activated part of the nervous system. And so they have a harder time getting back into that rest and digest part of the nervous system, right? The parasympathetic nervous system. And so a lot of our kiddos are already at that elevated height. And then if you add sensory sensitivities into it, which is, you know, check out that previous episode as well, it can, it can really wreak havoc and and just make it so much harder. There's other little things, more technical things, you know, both anxiety and ADHD, they're both associated with lower levels of GABA. And that helps us, like I said, process the sensory information and respond in expected ways, right? We would expect if they drop a cookie, a piece of their cookie on the floor, that they would be like, ah, that sucks. And keep on walking, not drop to the ground, kicking and screaming. Ah, it's the end of the universe. Cause they dropped one tiny little piece of their cookie, right? We wouldn't expect them to respond in that way. Um, but the GABA is really affecting how they're responding and how they're processing that sensory information. And so when the cycle isn't working, it can lead to a hyperactivation in the central nervous system, which is why they're in the fight and flight so much more. Okay. Add to the ADHD symptoms that fight and flight symptoms that come along with anxiety, like constant worry, trouble sleeping, fatigue. We know that we're just putting all of those executive functioning deficits into a tailspin, right? And then we're seeing more irritability and arguing and just this big emotional dysregulation. And our ADHD kiddos, they tend to experience far more severe anxiety symptoms than neurotypically developing anxious kids. And so just we see how much this anxiety is actually creating so much more havoc for our ADHD kiddos than are typically developing. Um, some When we look at the causes, okay, so sometimes anxiety occurs completely independently from ADHD. Okay, so you got ADHD and you also happen to have some anxiety. Some of the time though, and oftentimes I actually see this in the kiddos that I work with, and especially the kiddos who aren't diagnosed with ADHD, it's gone, it's missed. The anxiety develops because of how much effort it is, how much stress, how much overwhelm kiddos experience just living with ADHD. And I'm talking unmanaged unrecognized, unsupported ADHD, right? That just makes it hard for kiddos to function in day-to-day life. 
and they get this feeling of overwhelm. So the, the executive functions, there's, there's things like time blindness. Like I said, I have no idea how 10 minutes is, how long that is. So I can't manage my time. I'm always running late. I'm always being yelled at the poor working memory, the poor emotional control, rushing, being late, putting things off, procrastinating. All of these things make us anxious. Even if you don't have ADHD, if you've had been under a time crunch, you've procrastinated, you've forgotten something in instruction, that is stressful. It's going to make us anxious. And when we're anxious, those ADHD symptoms are worsened. Okay. And so no wonder so many of our kiddos develop anxiety and so many adults develop anxiety because of just the amount of effort living with that ADHD. So the anxiety, it can be a secondary piece to the stress that's filled in the life of an ADHD kiddo or caused by the ADHD, especially, you know, when they have to put in so much more effort, so much more brain power than other kids, just to get through the basic tasks of the day, just getting through their morning routine of unpacking their backpack and putting their shoes, you know, putting their indoor shoes on and getting to their desk and pulling out their initial, like that's just so much more brain power and so much more effort than other kids. Uh, but a primary anxiety disorder that happens outside of ADHD, it tends to be more global and it's not only related to the executive functioning specifically, but, but certainly it can start with that, just the everyday stressors of life that turns into a more sort of global anxiety. Um, so with, with ADHD, they might start worrying about remembering instructions. Uh, remembering things that their parents told them to do. And especially if their parents are like, this is it, this is your last chance. If you don't remember today, that's it. You're grounded for the rest of your life. There's so much riding on that. What if I can't remember, right? Um, remembering to do their homework and managing their time and meeting deadlines and paying attention and avoiding mistakes and being impulsive and not saying the wrong thing, saying something dumb in the middle of class that I have to go to the principal's office or saying something offensive to a friend that now is going to cause a friendship fire, managing my emotions, even though somebody else is being a jerk or cheating at soccer, right? They're feeling all of these feelings all the time. And when it continues on and on and on, no wonder they develop an anxiety disorder. And so we have this, I talk a lot about this epidemic of shame, which is not helpful. It starts in childhood, right? For kiddos with ADHD, they have repeated failures every single day, even just not putting the dishes away properly, putting a fork in with the spoon, failure because they're not meeting somebody's expectations. They're getting so much corrective feedback. By the time they're 12, kids with ADHD have received 20,000 20, more pieces of negative uh, feedback and messages about themselves than kids without ADHD. Within a 24 hour period, less than 24 hours, they're receiving more than 40 pieces of negative feedback, not just from teachers, it's teachers and parents and other teachers and other parents and kids. And, you know, in my class and out of my class, they're getting all this feedback all the time. And they're way more sensitive to this feedback than others as well. So when you add that anxiety onto everything else, these kiddos are experiencing way more problems socially, emotionally, behaviorally, academically, at home, and it starts to compound and compound, right? They hear messages like they're lazy. They just need to pick up their socks, right? If you have spent half the time doing your homework as you did on your video games, maybe you'd be successful. They're constantly being corrected, constantly told, being told that they're not doing enough. ADHDers have a lot of difficulties with motivation. Yes, but none of our brains are built for motivation, right? But that's why adults are always thinking of them as, as lazy, as unmotivated, as apathetic, as stubborn. I even get caught into that too with my daughter sometimes, my high school daughter. These kiddos are smart. They understand how to do things. But it seems like they don't care. It seems like they're dismissive. It seems like there's nothing in it for them. So why should I, right? It seems like they're lazy, but it's not because they're making these conscious choices. I think over time, what ends up happening is kids feel so defeated that they do just, you know, start to take on these sort of jerky behaviors because they're like, well, screw it. I have tried so hard 
and it's never good enough anyway. So I may as well just put up a front and not even try. But it's not because they started out that way. No kid ever wants to do poorly. Every kid wants to do good if they can. It's because of their brain's dopamine system. And dopamine is important for motivation. It's not working the same way as it is for other kids. So just very basic, easy tasks are so much harder for them to do, but it's all misinterpreted. And the big thing with ADHD too, um, where adults are constantly frustrated is with the inconsistency. I always say ADHD, um, these kids are consistently inconsistent, right? Um, And so you might hear yourself saying, you just did this five minutes ago. You could do it perfectly yesterday. Why can't you do it now all of a sudden, right? People expect because you've done it once, you can do it all the time. But ADHDers are consistently inconsistent, and that's so hard. And so that's why it's really easy to think of them being as lazy or unmotivated or not caring, right? And it's really hard because they usually are very motivated. They're very motivated, and they have the skills. They just can't use those skills when they need them. And so, of course, they're going to start. That's where the shame starts building. Why can't I do this? What's wrong with me, right? That inconsistency in their successes alone creates so much uncertainty, so much self-doubt for them, so much anxiety. And so in the ADHD brain, we see this sort of internalized hyperactivity, So they usually already have racing brains as it is. They have so much going on in their head anyway, and it's worsened by anxiety. And now it's anxious thoughts, right? And worries about what's to come or worries about things that I've already said. So oftentimes kiddos try to overcompensate for all the challenges that they have with ADHD. And it it manifests like racing thoughts for sure. Sleep problems, worry, 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 trying to run through scenarios in our head over and over, trying to remember everything that they need to do because they always forget. That creates, again, a lot of anxiety and self-doubt. Even just remembering those morning routines, that uses up so much of the working memory power. And when our working memory power is, like even that kiddo who I was doing skip counting with, super easy, he knows math, but because I'm draining his battery, you could visibly see him getting tired. Working memory drains so much of our brain power, which drains our ability to regulate our emotions. And it creates a lot of tension. There's just too many thoughts. There's just too many emotions, right? And you don't know how to start. You don't know how to prioritize all of this. And that gets jammed up in there. And it just creates all of this anxiety and overwhelm. So I hope you're seeing the patterns here and how anxiety, yes, it can be standalone, but oftentimes it's just compounding from those challenges. And it's really hard when we aren't addressing the ADHD, when kids aren't getting the diagnosis, aren't getting the support that they need. Oh, good to see excuse me. The other thing is the ADHD worries are very, very strong. Okay. I've talked before about the brain. Our memory stores are right next to the amygdala, right? And so we remember the big emotional memories, not the successes, not the happy times, not nearly as well as those big emotional times. So the more negative, the scarier the event, the more emotional the event, the stronger the memory because it's right next to our emotional brain. ADHDers have a really good memory for all the terrible things that have been said to them, that have happened to them, and that easily generalizes to different situations. And that creates worried thoughts versus happy thoughts. So all of this to say, right? We, we see a lot of this. We see a lot of things like perfectionism with ADHD too. For some, the ADHD makes it really hard for, for kids to set standards for themselves in the first place. But for some, there's such a fear of failure because they've experienced so much corrective feedback. And especially when procrastination becomes a really big problem too. So it's not just the executive functioning demands, but it's also they want to avoid failing. They want to avoid being embarrassed right? And so we see kiddos develop perfectionism as a way to sort of overcompensate for some of the challenges that they have with ADHD too. Um, I do already talk about perfectionism in a previous episode, so I'm not going to go back there. If you haven't already listened to that, because I do talk about how, if there's this underlying perfectionism, it gets in the way of any progress we make, whether we're talking about anxiety or ADHD or depression, if there's perfectionism that we're not addressing, we are never going to make things better, right? We're probably just going to make things worse. With perfectionism, we see kiddos feeling never good enough, 
They're shitting all over themselves all the time. Procrastination gets worse, right? Which just snowballs everything. Um, We see a lot of defensiveness whenever they are given corrective feedback. And we do know, like I said, the ADHDers are are very oversensitive to any corrective feedback anyways, compared to other kiddos. So a lot of them are going to dismiss any praise for sure. So if you have a kiddo like, wow, good job. And they freak out. This is a part of it, right? They they do that because that picture that you are presenting, dude, you're so smart. You work so hard on this. You're fantastic. It's very different from the picture they have of themselves and they're going to push back. And so for the ADHD, it's, it's just one thing after another, every single day, just the stressors of getting ready for school. That's something the ADHD has a problem with and can overreact to. So all of those things every day, and they're always being told they missed something, they forgot something, they didn't do something perfectly. It's really hard to feel much joy in life, right? And add on to that, man, it's just one thing after another. The ADHD brain, it really processes negative events differently from other typically developing kiddos, right? And so it's not only that they just remember the negative memories, it can actually really make them completely immune to any positive thoughts, immune to any positive messages. And so they're just jumping from one negative experience, one negative thought to another. And so hopefully that helps explain some of that. And so there's just so much uncertainty in their life. There's so much uncertainty about how they're going to do. There's so much uncertainty about what consequences they're going to face today. And so it's really that self-doubt, right, is going to start setting in, that shame. And when we look at uncertainty, when we look at self-doubt, that's fuel for anxiety. That belief that I can't handle it, whatever it is, whatever it is to come, Without, however, I'm going to perform. And remember, anxiety is the overwhelm and that belief that I can't handle it, right? So, so the problem with ADHDers is they're getting all of these messages from around them all the time about how they're not doing it, how they're not handling it. And so that self-doubt, those worries in the ADHD brain, it spirals out of control and it leads to so much overwhelm, right? And again, the worries and the anxiety, and that anxiety stemming from the ADHD and the challenges that they have. So this is an important topic because we can never really talk about ADHD without also talking about anxiety. Now, another big contributing factor is the fact that our ADHDers are smart kiddos, right? Most of them, like I said, they know what they're supposed to do, exactly what they're supposed to do. After all, They've been told a gazillion times anyways, even just that day from everyone around them, including siblings, including friends and other classmates. It's that performance deficit. They can't do what they need to do now. And so when you know what to do and you've done it before, but you can't do it right now in the moment, again, self-doubt, anxiety. Um, I get a lot of questions about why they can't do what they need to do about that performance deficit. One is impulsiveness. By the time they think about what it is that they need to do, they've already gone and done the wrong thing in the first place or gone and done the said the silly thing that disrupted their friendship or whatever it is, right? And, and when you're not thinking and when you're not realizing the consequences or what other people's reactions are after you've done something, that's really going to contribute to this sort of negative self-talk, negative beliefs about yourself and, and anxiety. So sometimes it's the impulsivity, just not thinking ahead of time. For some, it's the inability to self-regulate their attention in their first place. And so there is an impulsive piece here, right? They can't regulate their attention. They can't regulate their behaviors. Um, They can't regulate even their self-efficacy, right? So they're not sure if they can actually follow through with this thing successfully because they've got this brain snatcher who likes to distract them, who likes to get them off task. So even though I'm going in with really good intentions, it's the same thing with my husband. He's like, pay attention. And I open my eyes and I'm leaning forward. I'm really trying my hardest to do it. There's a little brain snatcher. The ball in the pinball machine drops. No matter how much I'm fighting to keep that ball going, fighting to keep my attention. There's a little brain strap, whatever will help for you. But I, I do love the analogy of the ball dropping, right? 
And so it's just so hard to keep on going. And so we've created these beliefs that I can't do it or I can't do it until the condition is right. I can't tell you how many teens I've worked with over the years truly believe that they have to wait until the last minute, for example, to do things because that's when motivation strikes. Well, that's understandable. Now everything, they're in fight flight. Now they've got the energy and everything else, right? We understand Yeah, but at what cost? How much rumination, right? And actually, if you leave it to the last minute, how good are you actually going to do than if you gave yourself the time, right? And it's so incredibly stressful to leave everything to the last minute, but they truly believe I cannot do it in any other situation or I can never study at home, right? They start creating all of these rules, Um, Emotion dysregulation is a major problem because our ADHD kiddos, they get so easily overwhelmed with their emotions in the moment that that prefrontal cortex, making good decisions, doing what they need to do, everything else, it goes offline. And I've talked so much about that in this podcast. So now they can't do what they need to do. That emotional brain is so much stronger than the executive brain. And that's true for everyone. And especially in the ADHD because it's delayed even further. So it becomes near impossible for an ADHD -er to do what they need to do. Working memory goes offline with emotions, right? And so the ADHD -er can't think about past experiences to guide their future behavior. They can't learn from past experiences. They can't remember things like this emotion, this overwhelm is gonna pass. And so they are stuck so intensely in that moment of emotion. It's so overwhelming. It's so easy to get sucked into this catastrophizing that this is the worst case scenario ever in the universe. It's the end of the universe right now. Even if you say, but yeah, yeah, you said that yesterday. Remember yesterday and then it passed and now you're here today. Yeah, 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 that was yesterday. But for sure today, for sure today, it's the end of the universe. So that anxiety is really good. It's a little trickster, right? It's really good at making us forget that we were successful, that we have been successful, that this will pass, right? And so especially in the ADHD brain, it cuts off any chance to draw from our successes, to remember that this will pass, to just wait, calm down, and then I can figure it out, to try to problem solve in the moment or the shortly thereafter. The ADHD brain is actually such a fantastic saboteur, right? Because like I said, kids want to do something. They want to do good. They want to do their very best. They want to do the right thing. They want to be the best, most loyal friend. They are committed to doing well. But the more they try, the more their brain betrays them. And having ADHD myself, I can't tell you how many times, you know, even things I've started one chore right? Okay. I'm just going to do this one thing, Caroline, just this one thing. This is your goal, nothing else. And then all of a sudden now I got 20 jobs, none of which are done. And I can't even remember what I started with in the first thing. Emotions rule. And especially in the ADHD brain, the ADHD brain shuts down so easily. It's so easily overwhelmed by different situations and all of the emotions that come with it. There's just so much going on. And now if we add anxiety to it, our anxious ADHDers, I mean, I could talk for hours and hours just on on the ADHD brain, right? And I do actually have a masterclass. If you want to learn all about ADHD, um, the intricate nature, but also how to support these kiddos socially, emotionally, academically, definitely check out my ADHD masterclass. I'll actually put a link in it um, in the show notes for you. But when we're coming back to that anxiety piece, the anxiety or the ADHD tends to be overlooked, right? And so we're usually looking at one or the other. We're not necessarily considering both of them. So on the one hand, they might seem really inattentive. That anxiety mimics a lot of the symptoms that we see in ADHD, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. And I really worry about these kiddos, right? Because these kiddos, the inattentive kiddos, aren't usually behavioral. Right. And so they keep that anxiety tucked in inside. You might not even realize it. Right. So, so they're in check. These ADHD kiddos are in check. They're doing the things that they need to do because of their anxiety, but they're suffering so much internally. And I see that all the time. Well, no, like they, they don't procrastinate. They're meeting their deadlines. Their room is immaculate, right? They're paying attention, but it's because of the anxiety. 
that I must do this. And that's where we start seeing a lot of perfectionism. But then there's those who can't keep it all contained, right? And so for these anxious ADHDers, the anxiety looks really like problem behaviors. Emotion dysregulation I've talked about is the core deficit of ADHD. And so these kiddos might look like ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, right? So when they internalize it, it might not look like ADHD because they're keeping it in check, but when they can't keep it in check and it comes out, it comes out behaviorally. And I see this all the time. I get see kids diagnosed with ODD. I have never actually met a kid with ODD because every single one of those kiddos I've worked with, and I've worked with kiddos, I've been punched in the face. I have seen very extreme behaviors, ODD. It's really easy just to say it's ODD. But every single one of those kiddos who had that that, that diagnosis usually had underlying anxiety. They all did have underlying anxiety. The worst one who, who, where I was punched in the face, there was significant trauma in his life, right? But that anxiety goes missed because we see the behaviors, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about in the future, but, but those behaviors are there to protect them. Those are anxious kids. And I do have another episode coming up specifically on ODD. So if you want to learn more about that, definitely check that episode coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, So an example that I love sharing when I'm talking about this is if you've ever stubbed a toe or you've hit your head, how do you respond? Adults, it's usually, oh, jeepers, right? Fruitcakes, we usually swear. We usually respond aggressively. If we only focus on that behavior, if I didn't see what happened right before and I just see someone cursing, right? Oh man, you've got an anger problem. We respond aggressively. The pain part of our brain is triggered. And when the pain part of our brain is triggered, we respond aggressively. And so now our ADHD kiddo is reprimanded because they acted out their anger. But what if you do, what would you do differently if you knew that that kiddo was in pain or scared? or trying to protect themselves, probably very differently, right? Than if you just thought they were an aggressive ODD kid. Now, for a lot of these kiddos, if we can treat and support that ADHD effectively, oftentimes the anxiety goes away. The stress decreases, we can pay attention better, um, we can stick with things better, we're listening better, so we're following through better, We're, we're less likely to make mistakes. Our executive functioning brain, the resources, that battery isn't so depleted so we can actually manage our emotions and manage any anxiety that comes up. So we really got to think about that. And that was true for me. Actually, my whole life, I was anxious, anxious, anxious. My parents put me on antidepressants when I was a teenager. The day I took medications for ADHD, it wasn't until I was like 40, but the day that I did, I swear to you, my anxiety was gone. It's not to say I still don't get stressed out. Of course I do, but not the anxiety that I was um, managing before because of all of the effort and overwhelm and and, uh, everything that I had to put into my day, okay? Um, But when our worries start to extend beyond the overwhelm of just ADHD, right? And those worries start to interfere with the day-to-day life or the anxiety is just completely separate anyway. And it's starting to trickle into other things. My anxiety really was all around, when I look back, all around the executive functioning deficits, meeting deadlines, remembering what people were saying, staying engaged in conversations, remembering to do things that I needed to do, right? All of those things, all the anxiety really was around the executive functioning things. And there's still some perfectionism. I still struggle with, you know, what people think of me and making a mistake and all of those things. I think that that's just come along with, because of all the mistakes that I've made in my life, right. And being called out for in my life. Um, but, but when it starts to extend and it starts to separate and it starts to generalize in, into other areas, then we've developed an anxiety disorder. And so now we also have to treat that. So sometimes it's just the ADHD we need to treat, but if it extends, it goes on too long. Now we got to look at both. Looking at treatment options, we know ADHD is is best treated with a combination of medications and behavioral strategies. Um, And I also do, we, we need to think about the environmental considerations too. And that's part of the behavioral piece, the behavioral side of things. Um, 
we're going to get into that next time. I'm going to leave it there for today. There's so much information to go through, but I hope this helps you understand the uh, some of the the overlap between that anxiety and that that ADHD, and I'll be talking a little bit more next time. So definitely tune in next week. Like I said, if you have any questions anytime, reach out to me. If you want to check out either my ADHD masterclass, my anxiety masterclass, definitely do that. I would love to have you join me. Um, and I do regular consultations as well with professionals, whether it's around anxiety, ADHD, autism, all of these things. I would love to chat with you. Enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you next time.